This is a beautiful lenticular galaxy NGC 4526 and it's about 50 million light years away from the Earth. You might think that this is a foreground star in our galaxy, but no. The object is also a part of NGC 4526 and it's a supernova SN1994D and it's as bright as a billion stars. This is another example of a supernova, but this time twice as far, a hundred million light years away. The image on the left is made in the Lake Observatory in 2002, and in the image of the Hubble Space Telescope on the right, made three years later, we can no longer see it. These examples help us at least somewhat comprehend how powerful such events are. Recently there has been some speculation that Betelgeuse might have already gone supernova. Some people wanted to witness a supernova with their naked eyes, while others were worried how a supernova 600 light years away might affect life on Earth. Anyway, most likely it's not happening in the near future, but why wait for 100,000 years? What if there has already been a near-Earth supernova? Today we are going to talk about evidence for near-Earth supernovae and how it could have affected life on Earth. My name is Andre and this is Cosmos Elementary. There are different kinds of supernovae and today we are not gonna dive deep into classification and the physical process itself. On a very basic level here we can see four different types. Three are core collapse supernovae. When a massive star approaches the end of its main sequence life cycle, it runs out of hydrogen to sustain thermonuclear reactions in its core that maintain balance between gravity that's trying to contract the star and outward pressure. Without fuel, gravity wins over, the core collapses and the star explodes. Type 1a supernova explodes in the binary system, where a white dwarf pulls material from its companion star and approaching a certain mass limit, it also explodes as a supernova. I talked about this process in more detail in my video on zombie stars, I'll leave a link down below. Actually, supernovae are quite rare. I've already told that only stars that are massive enough can end their life as core collapse supernovae. Usually it's said that a star has to be at least 8 times more massive than the Sun, or perhaps a little less than that, 7.3 solar masses. Firstly, it's not quite clear whether core collapse is followed by the explosion in each and every case. Secondly, there simply aren't that many massive stars. In the Milky Way, 70-80% to of stars are red dwarfs. This chart shows that only 1% of all of the stars are 4 solar masses and above. Which means that stars massive enough for core collapse supernovae are less than 1%. But we observe lots of galaxies. How often are new supernovae detected? Obviously, the better technology and especially survey telescopes, the more supernovae are discovered. In this list we can see that in the beginning of the 20th century, at best one supernova was discovered in several years. And now let's scroll up. Yeah, that's a lot of supernovae. According to this database, in 2020 alone 4036 have already been discovered. LSST or Vera Rubin telescope that is currently being built and is supposed to start working in a couple of years is expected to discover 3 to 4 million supernovae during 10 years of operation. But obviously this is the observable universe, but how often do supernovae occur in our own galaxy and especially not far from the Earth? Modern estimates suggest that up to 3 stars can go supernova in our galaxy every 100 years. This means that during several billion years at least one supernova could have happened very close to Earth. Within 10 parsecs or 30 light years from the Earth, it could have had a significant effect on life on Earth, might have even caused the mass extinction. At a greater distance of 100 parsecs, which is still not that far, it is expected that a supernova would occur every several million years. That would probably not have caused mass extinction, but still could have some effect on the Earth's biosphere. What are the known examples of the closest supernovae? SN1987A remains the closest observed supernova explosion in the last 400 years. The star exploded not in the Milky Way, but in the Large Magellanic Cloud 170,000 light years away. Still kind of far. Previous closest supernova occurred in 1604. It's also known as Kepler supernova because he observed it. 
This image of the supernova remnant combines data from Hubble, Spitzer and Chandra telescopes. Supernova remnants are made of matter ejected from the dying star, as well as the matter of the interstellar medium, which ejected material interacted with. The distance to 1604 is about 16,000 light years, and yet it was seen with the naked eye. This is a supernova remnant of SN 1572. It was discovered by Tycho Brahe in 1572, and it's 10,000 light years away. And of course, I can't ignore the famous Crab Nebula, which is a supernova remnant observed in 1054 by Chinese astronomers. Astronomers. It exploded much closer, 6,500 light years away from the Earth. But this is Vela supernova remnant. The explosion itself happened about 11,000 years ago, but it was way closer, only 800 light years away. And that's comparable with Betelgeuse. Perhaps it was visible even during the daytime, but it wasn't as bright as the full moon. In all of the cases mentioned above, we deal with either supernova explosions observed directly, in this case we know when it happened and can also measure the distance. Or we observe a supernova remnant. Knowing the distance and observing how remnant expands for extended period of time, we can calculate when it happened. But how can we find a supernova that occurred hundreds of thousands or even million years ago and even the remnant is no longer there? Turns out we can, and we have to look not up, but rather down, underground. People often associate supernovae purely with destruction, but that's a bit unfair, because they also create. Big Bang nuclear synthesis created only the lightest atoms. Hydrogen, helium, specifically helium-4, and also a couple of their isotopes and lithium. The rest of the heavier elements were created later, mostly in processes involving stars. This periodic table shows us sources of elements, and today we are especially interested in iron. Here it is associated with supernovae. We are mostly going to talk about a specific isotope, iron-60. To put it simply, isotopes are versions of the same element with the same amount of protons in their nucleus, but different amount of neutrons. A simple example would be isotopes of hydrogen. The nucleus of a regular hydrogen atom consists of one proton, the nucleus of deuterium of a proton and a neutron, and tritium of a proton and two neutrons, and so on. Another thing that there are stable and unstable isotopes. A nucleus of an unstable isotope undergoes a radioactive decay, and one isotope decays into a different daughter isotope. Unstable carbon-14 decays into stable nitrogen-14. Different isotopes have different half-lives, which is the time needed for half of the particles to decay. It could be fractions of a second for some isotopes and millions or even billions of years for others. This phenomenon is used to determine, for instance, ages of fossils. Now let's get back to iron. The most abundant iron isotope in the universe is iron-56. It's stable and doesn't decay, but there is another iron isotope that can be found on Earth, iron-16. Its half-life is about 2.6 million years. When it decays, it turns into a daughter isotope cobalt-60, which is unstable, and its half-life is only 5 years, which in turn decays into a stable granddaughter isotope nickel-60, which doesn't decay. Let's say we have some initial amount of iron-60. 2.6 million years later, half of it decays, and we are left only with 50%. Another 2.6 million years later, half of that decays and we're left only with 25% of the initial amount. But our Earth is over 4.5 billion years old. Whatever amount of iron-60 there was on Earth after formation, all of it had to turn into nickel-60 long time ago. But we keep finding it. Where does it come from? From space, and to be more specific, from supernovae. Iron-60 is found in ferromanganese crust on the bottom of oceans. These layers are slowly accumulated during millions of years. It's found in multiple locations basically all around the world. The sole fact that there is some Iron-60 on Earth suggests that there was a near-Earth supernova, but the questions are when and how far. How can we determine when it happened? A radioactive isotope from a supernova reaches the Earth, but we don't know how much of it there was in the first place to be able to see how much of it is left and knowing its half-life calculate when it happened. But that's not how it works in this case. 
Scientists extract samples containing iron-60 from various locations and, using modern methods of dating, they determine the ages of those samples. Back in 2004, this article was published and it was about some iron-60 anomaly in oceanic samples. What's the anomaly? This graph is from the article. Horizontal axis is age in millions of years and the vertical axis is a fraction of regular iron and iron-60. We can see that mostly the amount of iron-60 stays about the same. But here is an obvious spike. Later research also confirms that. This is from the 2016 article. All this means that about 2.5 million years ago, amount of iron-60 on Earth increased noticeably. By the way, if iron-60 got to the Earth, shouldn't it also be on the Moon? And it's there. Unexpected amounts of iron-60 were found in lunar samples. And it agrees with the Earth data, but in the case of the Moon, we can't exactly determine when iron-60 got there. This graph from the most recent article shows us data from multiple sources on the Earth and the Moon, and everything points to the event between 2 and 3 million years ago. Data also suggests that there could have been another event between 6.5 and 8.7 million years ago. But that's not all. Another piece of evidence for near-Earth supernovae is the local bubble. Interstellar medium is not the same everywhere. It differs in density and temperature, and now our Sun is inside the so-called local bubble. It's a region of interstellar medium of irregular shape. Inside the bubble, gas density is very low, but the gas is really hot. The region is about 300 light years across, and it's surrounded by denser and colder gas. This volume of the average interstellar medium would contain about 500 hydrogen atoms, but the same volume in the local bubble would contain one hydrogen atom at best. The cavity could have been created by supernova explosions that pushed away most of the interstellar material. Using data on the local bubble and computer simulations, scientists calculated that the bubble might have been created by 14 to 20 exploding stars that probably had been a part of Scorpius Centaurus Association. A moving group of stars that is now several hundred light years away from us. Stars exploded closer to the Earth, and since then the group moved away. Scientists say that at least two supernovae were close enough to the Earth to affect the Iron 60 deposits. So we have Iron 60 that could have formed only in supernovae. Also, we've got a local bubble, a result of those explosions. Everything points to a near-Earth supernova or two that happened between 2 and 3 million years ago. Some scientists believe that one explosion occurred 90 to 100 parsecs from the Earth, which is about 300 light years. That's almost three times closer than Vela supernova and twice as close as Betelgeuse. And it had to be a core collapse supernova. How such a close supernova could have affected the life on Earth? Of course, at that distance it wouldn't have looked anything like this, but still, it could have had some noticeable effects. Electromagnetic radiation reached the Earth first. It could have looked as bright as the full moon for about a year, and it could have affected animals that used the moon for navigation. It's known today that artificial lighting can influence the behavior of some animals. Also, such a bright light source in the sky could have affected the release of melatonin of our ancestors. Besides visible light, high-energy radiation, such as extreme ultraviolet, X-ray and gamma radiation, hit the Earth. But from 300 light years, it wasn't that catastrophic. Although 500 years after the observed explosion, high-energy cosmic rays hit the Earth. And they probably continued arriving for thousands of years. They could have weakened the ozone layer, and because of that, more ultraviolet radiation from the Sun started reaching the Earth. That could damage DNA of animals and make photosynthesis worse. Also, the amount of muons that reach the surface of the Earth could have increased dramatically, and this could be the reason for some mutations and also higher risk of cancer for larger animals. By the way, the supposed supernova occurred about 2.5 million years ago, and that's close to the end of Pliocene and the beginning of the Pleistocene, which had some colder periods and ice ages. Some scientists think that particles from supernova could have created more clouds, which led to a colder climate. Also, in this article from 2017, scientists announced that they might have found another marine extinction that had been unknown before. And again, it happened more than 2 million years ago. About the third of species in the oceans, especially in the shallow coastal waters, could have gone extinct. 
there is a hypothesis that the reason for this extinction could be a supernova. All of this is the subject of active research and perhaps we will learn a lot more in future. So there is a good chance that the near-Earth supernova actually happened and perhaps it had noticeable effects on life on Earth. Sure, stellar explosions sound scary. But on the other hand, in a way we exist because of supernovae. A supernova explosion could have triggered formation of the solar system, and even our bodies consist of some atoms that were created in stellar explosions. Links to all of the sources are down below in the description, and if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, comment and subscribe. Bye!